Hello and welcome to the second week of Inside COP15, live from our studio in Copenhagen. It's going to get much busier around here from now on, because today conference organisers announced that they were going to stop several of the observers getting into the Bella Centre. There will be a lot of angry people on the streets. There's only four full days left of the negotiations and it's really starting to get interesting. Earlier today, several of the developing countries pulled out of the summit on the condition that their voices weren't being heard. There's going to be plenty more of that coming in the next few days. But it's all sweetness and light here in the studio. Today I'm joined by Jens Gelschiot, sculptor, Suzanne Sayers from the Metro newspaper and Jacob Malthouse, internet guru. So I think a good place to start at the beginning of the second week is how do you think things are going so far? Jens, we'll start with you. You're, you're local to the area, so how do you think things are going at the conference? Uh, I have put uh, a lot of lights this one around. I think, I don't know what happened in the conference, I think they talk and talk and talk and nothing happened, I hope, <laughs> of course. But I'm not a good believer for that. I put this one all over the town and a lot of sculpture to show where the seven meters line is, when all the Greenland's ice is melting, when the, the summit are failed, then this will come, then the water will come, then the disaster will come. And I try to make a lot of sculpture around the Better Center and around the Little Mermaid to show this is not about polar bear, this is not about frog, this is about human, this is about refugees. The uh, UN expect about uh, 200 million of refugees about the next 40 years. And I think this is the worst problem. This is the refugees. I know that mankind is really, really bad to take care of people who want to go to their territory. And I think if we will see in the future, we will see a lot of breakdown in the civilization, a lot of places, maybe war or something like this. And this is the reason I put this slide up to, to, to make him a warning and say, if you don't do something, if you if you fail this, and if you fail the next meeting also, then it will come, then the disaster will come. And I think you should discuss that. Absolutely. So we'll have a closer look, actually, at some of your sculptures later on. So what do you think, Suzanne? How do you think things have gone so far? I think, seen from the outside, it's actually very difficult to see some of the people, you know, saying, we'll walk out of this, or we'll, uh, we're upset, or we're happy. How much of it is tactics, and how much of it is really heartfelt? Um, but I do know that when I speak to some of the representatives from the NGOs and especially from poorer countries, they do feel a kind of cynicism from the rich countries and feel that they're not being listened to. Mm -hmm. One of them told me, well, people are just sitting looking at their blackberries, they're not listening. Um, yeah. And I spoke to, to a guy from uh, Tuvalu yesterday who said, we're here with a very important message, we want to survive. This is not about games, this is not about quotas, this is about survival. So I think that message is quite strong. Absolutely. And um, what do you think, Jacob, so far? Well, it's very interesting looking at, at both of your perspectives. In, in one way, you're, you're using sculptures in the physical space to create action or to encourage action. And Tuvalu is coming with a very strong message of action as well. One of the most surprising and, and encouraging things at this conference for me has been just the incredible energy coming out of the social media sphere. You see video cameras all over the place, things like this interview, bloggers, Twitterers, you know, following, following very much in real time what's happening. And uh, I think it's really, really encouraging. In a sense, what social media is enabling us to do is to all become sculptors of action. Um, and deciding on what those actions are is is very encouraging for me, I think, irrespective of what's happening in the governmental arena, the human arena around the event is very exciting. So more specifically with you, Jacob, we've introduced you as an internet guru. What exactly are you doing here at the Copenhagen Climate Science? Well, Sports? I'm not sure I'm, I would say I'm a guru, but we, we, uh, we had this idea to actually harness the internet infrastructure itself. And so you have a .com or a .org, .dk. We thought we should create a, a .eco and actually have a green space on the internet but it has to be really more about uh, just branding, not just branding, but really about action and this theme of action. And so we're trying to pull together a global movement of, of sculptors, essentially, organizations, companies, etc., to help us understand what actions people would need to take in order to register a Dadiko name. For example, calculating your environmental footprint or committing to take actions to reduce climate change. And you have to renew those domain names every year, and they could be for millions of companies and individuals all over the world. So we hope it can play into many of these other actions uh, around the world that are being thought of here. Just trying to be 
a little innovative, um, using existing technology to, to do something green. What would stop a, an oil company with a load of greenwash getting a do do eco name? Well, that's why we've engaged groups like WWF, Green Cross, uh, Akitu Institute, Hewlett Packard, and others to actually think about those hard problems. You know, it's easy for me to say, oh, it should be this or that. But in fact, we found that collaborative action really generates more robust results. So what we're talking about now is the idea of using transparency to try and improve performance over time. This is the idea that eco is a journey, that we're always learning what's green. I mean, if you'd asked me five years ago, um, I didn't realize actually that red meat was such a huge carbon emitter. And so I've been trying to cut down on my red meat intake and these sorts of things. <laughs> and so it's through this sort of learning process that we go through that we learn to be green. And that's really what we're trying to encourage with Stadico. So bring everyone together so they know where to find everything and they know who's got the common interest. Exactly. And sift up. Who are the best performers accurately in a comparable way? Right now it's so hard. I mean, everybody is talking and saying that they're green. There's this huge uh, amount of greenwash. And really the best way to tackle that is through transparency and good data. So Suzanne, how has, the, how has the media been dealing with the conference so far? What's been the main, are people concentrating on what's going on at the Bella Centre or has there been a lot of media interest in the more colourful stuff in the city? Well, I think what, what you were saying was very interesting about all the social media because mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I think that may be one thing that's going to make a difference. I was speaking to Bjorn Lumbo, who was formerly known as a climate sceptic. You, you can debate what he is today but who is saying that there's a real danger that nothing will come out of this summit, nothing happened. There was a lot of enthusiasm in 92, there was a lot of enthusiasm in 97 at the Kyoto, and then nothing happened. And he said, well, it's going to be the same again, or there's a danger of that. And I think the difference this time may be the social media and the huge interest that is not only among decision takers and NGOs and the few green observers, but I feel like this time there's a real common interest, which is global, which yeah. is probably the first time that people in Niger, people in Guatemala, people all over the place basically have a chance of figuring out what is happening and I actually care. Yeah. Um, so I think, think so that may be the, the most exciting thing about this. Yeah. The newspapers cover it much as they've always done. They mm -hmm. cover both the decision level and the event level, what mm -hmm. is going on in the street, what do people think, obviously all the demonstrations, unfortunately mainly those that got arrested and not so much the 99,100 that didn't, <laughs> but again that's business as usual, I think it's the social media making the difference this time. Do you think that's overtaking the papers because people can interact, people can no, get their No, I, I, I think they're sort of uh, supplementing each other I, and will do for some time yet, maybe not forever and ever, but for some time yet. And some of the media, the traditional newspapers, are also platforms of social media. They, they have their own Twitters, they have their own Facebook entries and what have you. So, yeah. so Jens, we'll come back to you. See your lights are flashing here. Uh. <laughs> I've noticed the lights around, around the city. You've set them at seven metres, which is the level of the water if all of Greenland, the ice in Greenland melts. Mm. Is that correct? Yes. Um, so what, what is the story behind those? What made you put the red lights up? And you've got, you've got several art pieces. I've actually got some footage here of your mermaid sculpture. Oh ah, yes, the survival of the fattest, the call. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but this is, maybe this is, uh, this, this sculpture is showing what, what this is about. Uh, we are discussing the, the, the rich world. We are together here. A lot of powerful people from the poor world are together here. Mm -hmm. And some few people from Tuvalu mm -hmm. and these people. But we are the rich world and we are sitting on the back of this poor people mm -hmm. in a way and we will do everything to help them everything we say oh we are so we're worried for you and we can see what happened but but in the end we don't want to step down for their back we should make a lot of money a lot of help to protect uh, the coast in Bangladesh to protect the, the, the drying out in, in, in Africa and all this kind of thing and we do nothing we talk and we talk 